family. Y'all doing all right? All right. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, good. Welcome to BT Church. I'm Pastor Nick, one of the pastors on staff here. I have the awesome honor and privilege to share with you this morning from God's Word. We are in week 22 of our series, Jesus is Better, from the book of Hebrews. And so uh, we are going to continue to plow through this book. If you have your Bible, uh, meet me in chapter 10, verse 19. While you're doing that, I want to welcome everybody who is joining us online or watching us via the app. Uh, So glad that you you joined in and want to welcome everybody watching in in one of our uh, overflows. Appreciate you. We still have some space in the main auditorium where you can come in, Um, and and so we're excited about the space. We're also excited about BT Edinburgh being one year old today. Exciting. God is doing some great things at Edinburgh uh, through Pastor Mike and the team, and today uh, we're just celebrating what God is doing. Um, This morning, if this is your first time with us, you came on a very special day. Uh, The reason why you came on a very special day is because it is week 22. (laughs) And here's why week 22 is special. It's a reason, a real reason. Because now we're going to see a transition in the author's teaching in the book of Hebrews, because now he is transitioning uh, away from just the theology and the doctrine of the book, and now he is transitioning into uh, more of the application of the theology and the doctrine of the book. Uh, we, we've said it uh, throughout this series that uh, the recipients of this letter, they were under intense uh, pressure and persecution, and some uh, may have been motivated to turn back away from Jesus and turn back to uh, Old, Old Testament ritual, uh, turn back to their own idolatry, ultimately turning away from Jesus. But the writer of Hebrews wants to communicate one overarching thought to the recipients of this letter, and that overarching thought is this, Jesus is, y'all been here, yeah, Jesus is better. And that is a powerful statement. It is not just a statement for us to fill our minds about important information about Jesus, but that important information about Jesus, that important information that Jesus is better should lead to life transformation. And so now we're going to shift in this book and transition to more of the transformative life applications that build off of the truth that Jesus is better. So that's, that's, the, that's why you picked a great week to start coming to BT Church, okay? I told you it was a reason. Uh, verse 19 You have it? All right, it says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest 
over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Verse 23, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Verse 25, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning for the opportunity to preach your word. It is my prayer by the power of the Holy Spirit, God that your word is clearly communicated. Lord, it is my prayer that Jesus Christ is highly exalted. It is my prayer that your people are beautifully blessed. So, we are here. Amen. Some of y'all still got your heads down. Amen. (laughs) We are here now, chapter 10. And now the author is going to end a few brief words recap all of the theology and doctrine that he's just covered the previous chapters. And he lets the readers know that Jesus is better. And because Jesus is better, we now have some better benefits. We have better benefits. And and there are two major better benefits that he breaks down in our passage. The first major better benefit because Jesus is better, is this, that through Jesus, we now have access. We now have access through Jesus Christ. This is important. It is an amazing truth that we shouldn't lose sight of, that because of Jesus, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the cross of of Christ, his sacrifice, we now have access to God. This, this is amazing. I, I sometimes hear Christians talk and, 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 and I know they mean well, and Christians say, oh man, I, you know, I, I wish, you know, I was around in the Old Testament so that I could see the miracles and the signs and the wonders that, that happened, you know, back then when, when, when God made, you know, the sides of the Red Sea rise up and they walked on dry ground, I wish I could see that. Or I, I wish I, I could see the miracles that, that Moses performed or the miracles that Elijah performed. We, we want that same power, God. We want that same fire, God. We, we want that now. But here's the thing. For Christians to desire to settle for the signs of the Old Testament, points to a misunderstanding of the important truth that now, through Christ Jesus, we have a better access to God. Why? Because even though all those signs and all that wonderful and grand stuff was happening in the Old Testament, guess what? The access to God was limited. Why? Because only one man could enter into God's presence One time, one day a year. It's 365 days in a year. But one man could only enter into God's presence one time, once a day, once a year. I mean, that's crazy, right? Like when you really have a relationship with somebody, you don't just want to see them once a year. Like, try to work that out. See, see how that goes. You know, I love you, baby. You're going to see me next year. That's not going to work. <laughs> That's just not going to work. We wouldn't settle for that in earthly relationships, would we? No. Why do we want to settle for that with a heavenly relationship with a holy God who moved heaven and earth to get us, to give us access 
to him and unlimited access through the blood of Jesus. It is, it, it is so freeing that we can boldly now enter the sanctuary. We can boldly enter the sanctuary where the presence of God is to enjoy the presence of God, to fellowship with God and learn from God and worship God. We now have access to do that. We don't got to settle for Old, Old Testament signs and wonders for that. Jesus is better. You know, I have had the privilege to preach at student camp at Camp Zephyr for the past four years, I believe, the past three or four years. And Camp Zephyr is a wonderful place. Uh, senior kids, when we have student camp and kids camp, it is a wonderful place. And when you're a speaker at Camp Zephyr, they really roll out the red carpet for you. Like you don't just get a bunk room. They give you a, they give you a nice room with some space. And it don't have no spiders in it. You know, like they clean out the spiders before the speaker gets there. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And, and a part of the red carpet that they roll out for us is we have a green room and that green room is stocked with so many good delicacies that you wouldn't expect for a campground to have. I'm serious. Like they don't just have graham crackers back there. Like they have good delicate, I mean, just chips and just nice foofy, foofy stuff. I mean, just <laughs> amazing. They have the cream soda in a bottle. <laughs> now you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it is amazing. Now, my daughter loves when I get to preach at Camp Zephyr. And she loves when I get to preach at Camp Zephyr, not because, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forth and all of that. <laughs> she loves when I go to Camp Zephyr to preach because she gets to go in the green room. And when she gets to go in the green room because she's connected to me, she gets to have access to all of the good stuff. And she takes snacks back to the room and she and I have to tell her, don't get in here and act crazy else they ain't going to invite me to come back. So just... <laughs> Just get about two or three snacks and then leave, you know, because I want to come back because it's nice. <laughs> None of the other children at Zephyr have access to the green room, but my child has access to the green room. Why? Because she's connected to me. And since she's connected to me, she has access and she has the ability to receive all of the benefits that come with being in my presence. This is what it means when the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, don't turn back because Jesus is better. Now we have better unlimited access. And, and I know that the persecution is intense and I know that the pressure might be severe, but don't think that going back to Old Testament religious ritual void of the person of Jesus Christ is going to give you better access with God because you have full access with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Next thing that he just briefly uh, brings up is the fact that we have not only access through Jesus, but we have advocacy through Jesus, that Jesus is a better advocate and we have better advocacy through Jesus Christ. Like, like if you thought that God stood up for the Israelites, just imagine how much more God will stand up for people who are connected in Christ Jesus. We have better advocacy. If there's a man, he's been in the news. His name is Charles Finch. And Charles Finch, uh, in 1976, he was convicted in the state of North Carolina of a murder. He was convicted of capital murder, sentenced to death. During that time in 1976, there was a lot of corruption in the county sheriff's office. There was uh, a lot of mismanagement of his investigation. There were some inconsistencies in the investigation. And on top of that, Charles Finch received some uh, incompetent advocacy, incompetent counsel. His, his, lawyer, his lawyer didn't deal with the case right because, because any good lawyer would have been able to spot many of these inconsistencies and, and got the case thrown out long time ago. But long story 
longer. He got convicted in 1976. And there were a group of lawyers at Duke University who decided to take up his case. He had been trying by himself to handle his case. He had been writing letters and those letters were being denied. And finally, a group of lawyers at Duke University, one of their programs, uh, chose to take up his case in 2001. And those lawyers begin to systematically break down the inconsistencies of that investigation and they begin to appeal. They begin to appeal. They begin to appeal. And ultimately, it was ruled in May that Charles Finch was, in fact, innocent and he was free. He walked out of, well, he didn't walk out. They rolled him out in a wheelchair at 81 years of age, a free man. He was an innocent man. And, and when he received adequate counsel, when he received the proper advocacy, it turned things around in his favor. Now, now, some of y'all are like, well, that was a great uh, law and order lesson, Pastor Nick. What does that have to do with where we are today? Here's why it's so important that we have advocacy through Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And the high priest, he carried the people of God into the presence of God. That's what the high priest did. He, he wore a, a, a plate and on that plate had stones and on those stones had each of the names of the 12 tribes. So whenever the high priest was in the presence of God, he carried the people in the presence of God. And, and what does Jesus do for us? He carries us into the presence of God. And we saw a few weeks back that he ever lives to make intercession for us, that Jesus is consistently advocating on our behalf. Don't shout yet, because why is that important? It is important because Jesus is a better advocate. We have better advocacy. Why? Because Charles Finch was innocent, but I am guilty. Here's why Jesus is better, because he don't get innocent men off, he get guilty men off. A little while ago, Pastor Louis was talking about rewards in heaven, and he was talking about judgment, and he was talking about the books. Listen, when I stand before God, I want my books closed. <laughs> Amen. The book of all my deeds, leave them on the shelf, Jesus. I just want the Lamb's book of life open. Amen. Amen. I, guess what? I know you want your book closed too. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You want your books closed too. Why? Because when we stand before a holy God, guess what? We're not standing before a holy God as innocent men who never did anything wrong. We are standing before a holy God as guilty men who are recipients of the grace of Jesus Christ. This is why we have advocacy. Now, when, when you have better advocacy, that should do something as we live our lives. We should have a confidence. We, not, not arrogance and not cockiness, but we should have a confidence. Why? Because if Jesus stood up for his people in the Old Testament when they were persecuted, how much more will God stand up for his people who are connected through Christ Jesus? We can say like Romans 8.31, if God be for us, who can be against us? There is, I love it because there's an old dead preacher, one of, uh, one of the greatest preachers throughout church history. His name was John uh, Chrysostom, and uh, he was, you know, preaching was his gift, but his gift got him in trouble. And so he was a great preacher, but that ended up getting him in trouble. And one day he is standing before uh, the empress, and she is... She is persecuting Christians and she's persecuting him. And, and there's an interesting exchange that, that talks about uh, his execution. And uh, the empress threatened him with banishing him. And this is what he said. He said, you cannot banish me for this world is my father's house. So that made her mad. And then she said, I will kill you. And then he said, 
No, you cannot kill me because my life is hid with Christ in God. And that made her mad too. And then John went on to say, well, before you try to say something else, he said, you cannot take away my treasure. She said, I'm going to kill you. Then she said, well, well, that ain't scary. I'm going to take away your stuff. He said, you can't take away my treasure for my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there. She says, I will drive you away from your friends and family and you will have nobody left. And confidence rolls up in him. And he said, no, you cannot. For I have a friend in heaven for whom you cannot separate me from. He said, I defy you and there's nothing you can do to harm me. She chopped off his head. No, she, she did. She killed him. But guess what? That didn't stop his confidence in Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews is encouraging the people of God that when you have access to God, when you have advocacy through Jesus Christ, that should motivate and encourage you to live a life full of confidence no matter what you face. Because Jesus is better. Now, he, that was all my introduction. He um, shifts to now the action steps. Because now there are some action steps, and, and, and if we have some time, we're we just going to go through them and look at them. And I need my Bible to preach, and you're going to need your Bible to follow me. Because in light of all of this theology and doctrine, access and advocacy, okay, what, what do we do? What do we do with it all? Well, the author has some very important action steps. Number one, y'all ready for action step number one? We draw near. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Drawing near. This is so important. Because of Jesus Christ, what can we do now with God? We can grow closer. We can draw near. This is important. Because we don't have to be at arm's length with God anymore. It reminds me of what happened uh, in the Old Testament when God told Moses, he told the people and Moses, he said, all right, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down and visit with you and, and, and I want to I want to congregate and be amongst my people. And so that day came and then this is before they started wilding and doing crazy stuff. That day came and God comes down in this thick black smoke and thunder and lightning. I mean, there's some epic Jumanji stuff happening on the top of the mountain and the mountain is shaking and, and everything's crazy. And the people of God are terrified. But Moses is excited. And Moses is like, all right, come on, God here. He done showed up. Come on, y'all. And the people are way back here like, I ain't about to go up there. The people don't draw near to God. They are terrified. They are scared. And Mo is like, y'all, God here. Come on. And they're like, no, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go up there, Moses, and you're going to come back and tell us what he said. Because we aren't going to draw near to God. You know, there's some people under the sound of my voice right now. You come to church, and when you come to church, you come not out of faithfulness, not out of adoration, not with a heart of worship, but you come with a heart burdened with fear of God, that God is mad at you, that God is done with you, that, that, that God is out to get you. No, God is not out to get you. God is out to set you free when you draw near to him. This is what we get to do. We get to draw near. And, and look at it. Look at it. How do we draw near? We draw near with a true heart. We can't draw near to God with a fake heart. We can't draw near to God with our pretend selves that we like to project that appear like everything is all put together. Guess what? I know that you ain't put together. Because I ain't put together. 
You know something? We try to act like we good. Oh, no, I'm good. No, you not good. You, you, you short, snappy, and angry. <laughs> if that's good, I don't want to be good. You know what I'm saying? You're not good. And so when we draw into the presence of God, we can come to God honest, y'all. We can come to God truthful. We, see, see, here's the thing. We need to come to God focused on who he is, not on who we pretend to be. This, this drawing near to God involves a total focus of the heart. That true heart that the author of Hebrews speaks of, it deals with a an intense focus of the heart without distractions. And that is so challenging in this day and age because we are very distracted. And I'm not just talking to the young people. I'm talking to the old people. And I'm talking to me because I'm old. My birthday was yesterday. So I'm telling you, you know, we are distracted. Sometimes you hear, you know, most seasoned people, you know, criticizing Young people, oh, they always on their phone. And, I don't, and then they be always on their phone, too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Old folks like Facebook. Young folks like Instagram. It's still social media. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We are a distracted people. But, but when we come to God, when we draw closer to God, we should be distraction free. There's somebody on their phone right now while I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not on you version, you on Pinterest. I know, we know these things. Preachers ain't crazy. Distra- in church, distracted. Psalm. 27 says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. He says, one thing, my one desire, my my intense focus, the overarching aim of my life is to draw close to God, to dwell in his temple and to behold his beauty. And that is what we have access to through Jesus Christ. Amen. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Notice that it says that our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. This deals with the inside, the inside, something that the Old Testament was not able to do. The Old Testament was not able to help cleanse us from the inside. That was one of the criticisms of Jesus Christ by the Pharisees. He was chilling with the Pharisees one day and they looked at Jesus when he got down to eat and they said, man, you didn't even wash your hands. Why don't you, why don't you wash your hands, Jesus? Jesus basically looked at him and said, I'm the cleanest one in here. He ain't said it like that though. This is what he said. That, that's what he meant, but this is what he said. He said, y'all worried about me cleaning my hands, but what you jokers do, y'all wash the outside of the cup and leave the inside dirty. How many of y'all washed this and used to get in trouble for that back in the day? Huh? So somebody said, still do, praise the Lord. Y'all, y'all, you just wash the outside. You didn't even deal with the inside. Look, it looked, it looked clean. It's food all in there. Orange juice pieces. Jesus, that's what he ultimately said to the Pharisees. He looked at them like, I'm the, I'm the cleanest joker in here. See, what, what y'all, y'all are so focused on the outside that y'all will clean the outside. He said, but, but on the inside, y'all just as trifling as you want to be. See, the Old Testament, the Old Testament was not able, it didn't have the ability to cleanse us from the inside out, but through Jesus Christ. And when we draw near to God, we are drawing near to God with a true heart and a clean conscience, a conscience that has been cleaned from the inside. And so when we draw near to God, We need to understand that we are drawing near to a God who does not 
just exists to give us gifts. God don't just exist to give us gifts. When we draw near to God only for what we want, that shows that we are drawing near to God more for our selfish reasons than for worship. And sometimes we have to be honest about that. It says we draw near to God with a true heart and a conscience clean, right? And not only do we draw near, but the second action that we get to do is we get to hold on. Hold on. Look at verse 23. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. We see the next action in the text calls us to hold on. Hold on to what? Our confession that Jesus is better. Our confession that Jesus is the son of God. We need to hold on to our confession. Now remember y'all, who is this letter written to? It is written to people who are persecuted and under intense pressure and may be motivated to let go of their confession. They're motivated to let go of their confession based on the condition of their circumstances. See, everything going on around them may not appear like Jesus is better. But the author of Hebrews says, listen, we need to hold on to our confession because our confession is not based upon our circumstances. Our confidence is not based upon what we experience, our, 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 our circumstances or, or what we're going through. That's, it's, it's not based on that. Our, our faith and our confession is based on the character of God. And this is why we're able to hold on. We are able to hold on because God's character is faithful. I know what your circumstances say, but God is faithful. I know what the doctor report says, but God is faithful. I know that the pressure you are under is very intense. These believers had had some of their property seized and some of their leaders were in prison. And, and the author is saying, listen, I know life is risky and rocky right now, but we hold on to our confession, not based on what we experience in our circumstances, but based on the character of God. Why? Because when God promises something, He's faithful to perform it. He says, we, we get to hold on. That means this, that we don't just trust that God is good in good times. But we say like the church, God is good all the time. All the time. Even on a bad day, God is good. A, a few days ago, few days ago, it got a little gloomy in the valley. Y'all remember that? I was in my office. It was, it was, it was bright. The next thing I know, boom, it went left real quick and it was dark and then it started raining. Some of our friends, let's pray for them, they are still dealing with the ap aftermaths of that. Now the clouds were out, it was dark and gloomy. It, it would have been ignorant of me to walk outside and say, oh man, because of the reality of the clouds, the sun not shining today. It would have been ignorant of me to say that. Why? Because the reality of the clouds can never stop the ability of the sun to shine. I said the reality, thank you. She's she gonna write it. I said, <laughs> The reality of the clouds can never stop the ability of the sun to shine. Yes, my experience of the sun shining may be, may be hindered, but the reality of the sun shining can't be messed with. And what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this, that circumstances in our lives may sometimes hinder our ability to believe the faithfulness of God. But hear me, he said, don't hold on to what you see. Hold on to your confession. Hold on to your faith. Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. The reality of clouds can't stop the ability of the sun to shine. And the reality of the persecution and the pressure that we are facing 
does not change the faithful character of our God. So hold on. So not only do we draw near, not only do we hold on. Let's look at the last action step that we're going to deal with. Verse 24. And let us watch out for one another. Not only do we draw near, not only do we hold on, but we get to watch out. Look at what it says. Let us watch out for one another to provoke Love and good works. Verse 25, here it is. Not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing. Uh Uh-oh, y'all know we got to do. Y'all know we got to do some work with that. We got to do some work with that. Why? Because he is writing to the church. And this is so important because if I am going to watch out for other people, that necessarily means that I am not by myself. If I am going to watch out for you, that means I have to be present and participate. So so when you come to church, your presence is not just required, but your participation as well. Yeah, we can clap for that. We can clap for that. He says we watch out for one another. Why? Think about it. Think about it. He's writing to the church and he encourages the church. He is writing to a collective body. Look at, look at, look at verse 22. Look at verse 22, the first two words. Let us, right? Look at verse 23. Look at verse 23, first two words. Let us. Now look at, look at verse 29. I ain't making this up. It's in the Bible, y'all. Look at verse, look at verse 24. First two words and let third one. Us, collective, corporate. He is not writing to an individual Christian that says, I can be a Christian, but I don't need the church. And there's some Christians who say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I would lift up Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. But let's just use your argument. I, I, don't, I don't have to be, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Let's just use your argument, all right? You ain't got to go home to be married either, but try that for a, a good little while <laughs> and tell me how that worked out for you. How long are you going to be married? No, you ain't got to go home to be married, but it sure make things easier. Make things better, right? Now, listen, listen. He's writing to the church, and he encouraged the church that you have access to God. You have advocacy through Christ Jesus in the presence of God. We are all drawing near to God. Here it is. If we're drawing near to God, that means that you're going to bump into other people who are drawing near to God. This is why when I, when I do pastoral guidance or counseling and, 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 and I'm talking to couples, I always say, you know, I always say somebody's not following Jesus. It's, it's a dead cat on the line somewhere. Somebody not following Jesus. Can't be because it's impossible for two people headed in the same direction to, to fall out of love. For each other. And then so, the, so I, I, and I grant it. Okay, you fell out of love. Okay, what would happen if both of y'all fell back in love with Jesus? All right, so fall back in love with Jesus. I promise y'all going to get closer together. Because if you headed in the same direction, eventually we're going to meet. We're going to get closer together, not further apart. Are y'all with me? Man, I got to fly. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't deal with this text like I want to, but, but, but long story short, if you are a Christian, yes, you need to go to church. Yes, you need the church. Yes, we need the church. Why? Because me by myself, I'm not the church. You by yourself, you're not the church. We are the church. And so, and so it's important. It's important. He says, he says, and not neglecting to gather together. Here it is right here. As some are in the habit of doing. Now, he's not talking about BT church. Because people are not in the habit of neglecting. But if you want to know whether or not you're in the habit of neglect, I have, I have a test for you. And Pastor H.P. Charles gave this test, and I said I was going to steal it and preach it to you. So you're not in the habit of neglecting 
if you only do it periodically, because then by definition, it ain't a habit. You see what I'm saying? So like if you go on vacation and you not gather together, well, that's not a habit. Why? Because it's vacation. Now, if you are vacating, Eight weeks at a time. That's a habit. I don't, I, try to vacate from your job eight weeks and see what would happen when you went back. Here's how you can see whether or not you're in the habit. Because I don't want I don't want us to be burdened down. Jesus wants us free, and I want you free. Here's how we can see whether or not we're in the habit of neglect. You ready? First test is this: If you can miss church and not miss church, you're in the habit of neglect. If you can miss church and not miss it, you neglect to gather together. You can miss church and not. Listen, even when I'm on vacation, you can ask my wife, even when I'm on vacation, there comes a point in time in my vacation that I start missing my house. I don't know, has anybody ever felt that? And it's because it's my house. Like, like there, there are two reasons. Like, one, I pay the mortgage, and that still come even when I'm on vacation. I'm like, since I got to pay, I might as well go back and visit it once in a while. <laughs> Bill don't care, you know, mortgage don't care you on vacation. It's coming. But then I start missing my bed, right? I start missing my pillows. I start missing just little stuff. I start missing how the water come out my own faucet. Like, you know, just simple stuff. Why? Because it's my house. That's where I live. That's where I have, I have planted my life. And if you can miss church and not miss church, you probably not planted in the church. That's the first test. Here's the second test. How do you know if you're in the habit of neglect? If you can miss church and church don't miss you, <laughs> how you know you in the habit of neglect if you can miss church and the church don't miss you this is why we've got to do away with this American Ninja Warrior Christianity where we run in and hit the little bell and then we run back out we got to stop all of that and plant our lives amongst the people of God You know, people always say, well, you know, I, I left the church and ain't nobody called me. Well, first thing, I, did they know you were there first? <laughs> did, did they know? And, and, and hear, hear me. Did you let somebody know you was leaving? Did you call... I'm sorry, I'm not trying to fuss. This is not pastoral fussing. It's in the text right here. We don't need to neglect. And, and what would happen, what would happen if you, if, if, if you neglected a child? What would happen? The police would come and they'd tell you about yourself, right? Right? What happened when you neglect your body and you go to the doctor? What happened? The doctor tell you about yourself, right? So yes, when you come to church and we're dealing with neglect, the pastor is going to have a great word. And somebody, oh, Pastor Nick, you just want people to come to church. Yes! <laughs> yes! What pastor don't want people to come to church? Every restaurant owner want people to come eat. Every dentist want people to come get their teeth fixed. Every doctor want people to come get checked out. So guess what? Pastors want people to come to church. That should be, that should be hard to understand. But, 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 but not only that, here it is. Not only that, not only that, it's not just about the pastor. It's about you too, because we watch out for one another. That is the overall goal of this text is to encourage the body of believers that even though we are under intense persecution and intense pressure, we are a part of the body of Christ. And when we are in the body of Christ, the body looks out for the body. Because look at, look at it in the text. Man, I, I, I got to go. He says, when we watch out for each other, we get to provoke one another to love and good works. That is inspirational irritation. That's what that means. Because whenever you're around people, you get irritated with them. And the Bible says that you don't need to neglect that 
inspirational irritation. Why? Because it spurs you on. It encourages you. It motivates you to do this. Love and do good works. When you were on your sports team, didn't y'all irritate one another? Yes. When you and your family, don't y'all irritate one another? Yes. If it don't, the men don't say nothing. Just blink at me fast and I know you feel me. <laughs> Just blink fast and I know you're with me. Amen. I got you. But that inspirational irritation is not to draw us apart from each other, but it's to motivate us. Here it is right here. To love and do good works. And I'm closing my Bible because not only do we watch out for each other, but we watch out for Christ's return. Look at it in the text with me, and then we're going. It says this, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day approaching. We don't just watch out for one another, but we get to watch out for Christ's return. And what does this mean? This means this, that, that, that there's persecution and there's pressure. And we know from the teachings of Jesus that the closer we get to his coming, the more intense pressure and the more intense persecution. Jesus calls it the labor pains and, and all of that. And guess what? Christians are going to need encouragement. We're going to need a loving arm beside us. We're going to need a loving finger in our chest. We're going to need somebody to be with us to encourage us because, yes, we get weak. Yes, we get discouraged. Yes, we get tired. But when you are connected to the body, God gives the body power to heal itself. See, we, we have healing power through the power of the Holy Spirit to heal one another. This is why, have you ever been to church and a brother or sister shared a timely verse with you and it just lit up in your soul? Have you ever been to church and you had a need and the church just rallied around you? Your brothers and sisters rallied around you to help you meet that need? That is what it means when we watch out for one another. And that is what it means when we watch out for Christ's return. Why? Because the same Jesus that saved us through his blood on the cross and gave his life for us and died for us and was buried and was resurrected and ascended, that same Jesus is coming back for his church. And we have watch parties for everything else. We throw watch parties for games. Losing team, but we still cooking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ain't no hope. But watch party, table spread. Everybody, the house full. Your team lose. You go home sad. Oh. Now people throw watch parties for their favorite series, the premiere of their series. People throw watch parties for shows. Well, guess what? The church is the corporate watch party for the coming of Jesus Christ. Why? Because when we gather to watch out for one another, we aren't just looking around, but we get to look up. We get to look up to the hills from which cometh our help. Our help comes from the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. So what's getting ready to happen, we're getting ready to worship the Lord and respond to this word. There'll be some men and women up here who want to pray with you. And I use that very intentionally. I don't, I don't, I don't like to say they're going to pray for you. Why? Because if you place faith in Christ Jesus, you have the same access to God as these ministers that stand up here today. So they're going to pray with you. Now, if you are here and you're not connected to Jesus Christ. You don't have a relationship with God. They're going to pray for you. And they're going to pray and ask God to fill your heart, to captivate your imagination with his goodness. They're going to ask God to save you. And what we want you to do is we want you to trust Jesus today.
If you know you haven't trusted Jesus, trusted Jesus before, you can do that today. Here's my last invitation. If you know that you are a Christian, but you are not a part of a local church, you know that when you miss church, you don't really miss church. And when you miss church, the church don't really miss you because nobody knows you. You're not connected. You don't give a church your presence or participation. You just pop in and pop out. If you know that's you, listen, you don't have to feel condemned. Why? Because today, something can be done about it. And you could come and grab one of these men and women's hands and say, I want to commit to the body of Christ here at BT, and I want this to be my church. When I miss church, I miss my church. When I was on sabbatical, I didn't know what to do with myself. People probably thought I was crazy. I would sit in the back of the church just twitching. I didn't know what to do. Because I missed my church. Well, guess what? We, we want you to have a church family. And we want BT to be that church family. I'm going to ask that you stand. Ministers, come up. And as they're coming, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for giving us the power to hear your word and respond. And, Lord, it is my prayer that people would hear this word and respond in faith, that people, Lord God, who may be motivated to give up, turn back, and let go, that, God, you would encourage their hearts this morning to hold on, that you would encourage their hearts this morning to draw near, and that, God, you would continue to move throughout the body so that we can watch out for each other and for your return. Now, Father, this time is yours. Move by the power of the Spirit in any way you want to. In Jesus' name, amen.